Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Scott Meyer with Artist Network, and this is Drawing Together, where we meet every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. So if you're new, I want to let you know that you can find the reference image that we will be working from, as well as a list of the materials in the description below. You can also share your work with us when you're done at artistnetwork.com, because that's really what this show is all about. It's about taking time to dedicate our, our at least some of our time to the practice of drawing to help improve our our skills in really any art form. So this isn't about mastering drawing. This is about simply doing the work that it takes to grow as artists. So we challenge ourselves with a new subject each week. Um, and this is the subject we will be working on this week. So let's get to it. Um, this is my preparatory drawing here, this drawing of the hand. I believe that was you, Jackie, that um, suggested some sort of figurative um, uh, subject. And I thought that was a very good choice. Um, so I found this image. Uh, you can see that below me on the screen here. Um, and the the real potential that this image affords us, is from at least from my approach, is to really engage with the form and volume of the hand. One of the things we talk about a lot in the show is is the role that an anatomical understanding of the subject may play uh, as an artist. Um, and you can really take that level of understanding uh, very deeply, especially with the figurative work when you have genres like um, anatomical illustration, for example. But the way I try to approach it is to try not to think about this subject as fundamentally different than any other subject. For me, drawing is about a set of decisions that we make about the subject. It's a way of processing that information and moving through that on the page to better understand the subject. So the drawing process is a way for us to gain a deeper understanding of the anatomy. Um, and it feeds itself. The more you understand about the subject, the better your drawings will be. The better your drawings are, the more you understand the subject. So. This is, um, this is one of those subjects that really puts that to the test. Hands are notoriously challenging to work with. Um, it's also one of those subjects that carries with it a strong symbol system. We have preconceived notions about how to draw them. And it can often be very challenging to override them. And that's what I want to kind of talk about throughout this process is that if you, if you try to separate yourself from describing this and identifying this as a hand and instead rely on the decision-making process of, that we all go through when drawing, um, it might help you to get there. And if that doesn't sound like it makes any sense to you, just hang on. Um, I will hopefully discover that. I love seeing where everybody is viewing from. I love seeing all the familiar names there on the board. If you are new, let us know where you're viewing from. Invite your friends. This is episode 147. So we have 146 other episodes that you can jump right into as well. Um, so if you're new, welcome. If you've been around for a while, welcome also. I love seeing everybody here. Okay, to this subject here, you can see I simplified the reference a little bit so that we could focus on the hand. You know, I, I left that background, the, that bowl or the pot there as, as being largely unfinished. I utilize that background only to the extent to which it helps support the form of the hand, right? So over here, for example, where it's darker, it provides a little bit of contrast where we can identify that reflected light within that shadow form of the hand. Again, terms that you may not be familiar with, but we will be covering that. Um, and lightening up this area here, again, to provide that contrast with the hand. Um, we will be talking about line, shape, value, all sorts of uh, things here in this drawing. Um, I am working with this gray-toned paper here. Um, I believe this is the Strath, I believe this is Strathmore, I can't remember which one it is, but this is a cotton rag paper and it's gray toned. I left this strip of white tape visible here so you can see its tone a little bit more effectively. So it's not really dark, but it is darker than uh, that pure white. And because we're working on the toned paper, it gives us the opportunity to explore the use of multiple media here. So I have graphite. This is a 4B, a relatively soft graphite stick. Um, for my pencils here, I have a 2B, 6B, and a 12B. These are the new uh, Faber-Castell pit um, 
matte graphite, uh, a lot of fun. So they're not quite as shiny or reflective as traditional graphite. I just got the set and I'm really excited to, to work more with it. Um, and then we also have a white um, charcoal pencil here if you have a pastel pencil. This will help to, to pull out some of the lights later on. Uh, for the erasers, excuse me there. For the erasers, I have my trusty Derwent retractable eraser carved down to this chisel tip. Uh, and I have a new kneaded eraser, this tiny little, little one, but it works very well. Uh, and let's see, I'm going to set these over here where they're not going to roll away. And then this well-used, well-appreciated tortilla and stump. So um, I really like using these things. And I'm going to, other than that, we're going to kind of keep it simple. I'm going to be blending with the palm of my hand as well. All right. Um, hello, everybody. Good to see you. If anybody was in on the Gustavo Ramos presentation yesterday on Artist Network, um, I found that very enlightening, a great portrait painter. If you don't know his work, check it out, Gustavo Ramos. Um, all right. It's been a busy day. My brain is spinning. And so this is the perfect time to be drawing because it helps bring me, bring me into focus here. Um, I'm going to start with my gesture. A lot of eye squinting. And, you know, I, I realize that I use the term gesture here, but it may not be the term that you all use. I, I think of a gesture as, as really the, the mindset of, of reacting to the form. And you can do that um, as a shape or as a line. Oh, so we see there's a little bump there that suggests something underneath there that could be problematic. Um, but I'm not worried about that too much. So again, I refer to a gesture as really just a simple reaction to the form, and you can you can be linear about it, or you can identify the forms as shapes. Um, so I'm keeping my eyes very softly focused. Squinting is another way to think about this. Uh, opening your eyes wide to let them flood with light can be helpful also. And at this stage, it's, this is where we, we really establish that mindset of treating the form and the subject as abstractions. And what I conceive of that as when I think about it as and, and label it as an abstraction, it's that part of my brain that is stripping away any sort of label or identification with the hand, any sort of emotional attachment to it. And I try to access that part of my brain that says, this is just the raw data, right? This is, I'm just looking at this. That's it. I'm not going to think any more deeply than just a, a, just a shape here, the shapes of light and dark. Now, I, I think that's virtually impossible to do completely. But I think there is also value in that basic mindset and trying to achieve that. Uh, and, and part of that comes through kind of practice. The more you practice that, the easier it is to access. Um, but um, again, my gestures is more kind of shape-based. And what I'm looking for are just shapes of light and dark so that I'm identifying that we have a dark area and a light area. That's it. I'm not qualifying that in any way. I'm just establishing it. I'm going to wipe that down with the palm of my hand. I think I will need a paper towel. I'm going to bring some darkness into the corners here. Kind of think about it vignetting a little bit as we go. Um, and again, if you're new, the objective for this show is really for us to be drawing together. I love to hear your own approaches, your insights, observations. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat. I'll do my best to answer them. Or if anybody else in uh, the discussion is so inclined. Um, and again, I'm just going to be talking through the processes that and the steps that I go through, the things that I'm thinking about. Um, but it may be entirely different than what you think about. Huh. So the texture here is it's a little problematic. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take 
another scrap of paper. And I'm going to slide that underneath. This is a little bit larger, but let's see how this does. And I guess that white strip gives us, again, another point of reference with regards to value. Um, it's one of the things we've talked about before in this series is that with value relationships, we often calibrate to the, um, the values that we see on the page and it skews our, our interpretation of them. I, I should also say that I'm working from the very small thumbnail on the screen in front of me right now. Um, and that is really helpful for um, kind of dispersing some of the, those details. Uh, and, and so as I squint, squinting and not only helps me see basic value shapes, but it eliminates those details um, so that I don't get overwhelmed by them. Um, I should also say, so this process is kind of, is, is informed by and helped inform my book that's coming out. You can see that, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's hidden back there, but it's called See, Think, Draw, and that actually comes out on the 7th, so I'm very excited for that to actually be hitting shelves. You can find links to that in the description below. But the objective for that book was to take these basic ideas, the idea that a drawing is about a set of decisions we make, and there, it's a process we go through in analyzing a subject and using the drawing process to do that, um, and then you can apply that to really any subject. And it's a great way to learn more complex things like figure drawing or perspective or light and shadow, things like that. You know, you, you, we challenge ourselves by giving ourselves subjects that help us confront some of those, those issues. Um, so I kind of point that out because after the gesture, the next step is my measuring step. So I'm still utilizing this graphite stick. Uh, the, I should also say that the graphite stick um, is something I enjoy working with here because um, it also, uh, it, it makes it harder for me to dig into those details. It makes it easier for me to embrace the, the abstract form of, of the subject. Um, so still using this, the stick, I'm going to move into the measurement phase. So now I'm looking a little bit more specifically about where I am. And typically the first step I go through is the angle sighting. So I look for the basic angles in these forms. Uh, and, and this is all about starting big and working small. So I, what I might first identify is this primary angle moving from that knuckle up. And I can compare that by using angle sighting. If you don't know what that is, it's a, it's a method um, that is very handy. It's, you use it when you're drawing from life or if you're drawing from a photograph, but we're simply comparing elements from the reference image to the drawing. So because from what I see in front of me here, I see the overhead capture of the, of the drawing, I see the small reference photo, I can see them side by side. If you're able to set up your drawing and your reference similarly, this will help you. Have your reference image, have your drawings adjacent to one another. They don't necessarily have to be the right, the same size um, for this to work because you can scale everything up proportionally. With angle sighting, though, those angles don't change. What I'm doing is closing one eye. So I have this stick here appearing to be directly on top of the reference image. I've lost any sort of depth perception because I've closed that eye. I'm targeting this angle on the reference photo, finding that angle, locking my wrist, bringing it over so that it places uh, and appears to be directly on top of the drawing, and I'm comparing that main angle to what I already have. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to identify the basic angle for the knuckles, letting that line run long, I'm going to try to find actually that finger. I'm going to try to break down into two sections. There's a slight bend in it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to triangulate this a bit. I'm going to try to find the 
tip of the finger and find that angle leading up this way. So I get something like that. And then as we move through the drawing, we're going to then add more specificity to the forms. So this is all very flat looking. Again, I'm not thinking about it anatomically. I'm trying to think of it just as a shape. In this case, when I hold my hand like that, it blocks the paper, so I have to switch hands. Ah, that's not helping either. I got to back out of the camera. Okay. So now we're left with something like that. Um, now the, the next step is to kind of calculate the, the distances between them. And there are a few, a few steps here that I go through. The first one I like to look at, the first tool I like to use is, are plumb lines. Um, so plumb lines are vertical lines or paths that you visualize in the reference identifying a key landmark. So let's, let's say that the tip of this finger here, if, if I visualize a, a vertical line running through there, I can see where it intersects these forms. I can compare that to the reference photo and I feel like it should be over a little bit. I have mine centered a bit too much, so that might mean that I've, I just need to move the tip of the finger over, but I also have this line here established, so that helps me to that helps me to make sure that I, I maintain this relationship that I established earlier. Uh, look at how dirty this is getting. Now I'm not worried about it. That's what erasers are for. I can clean that up later. Um, I want to do, use a, a horizontal guide now. I'm going to use this notch here. Visualize a horizontal path running through the reference photo. And that seems to be roughly in the right spot. My target for accuracy here is not very high. I'm not locking in on anything specific here, but I am hoping for perhaps, you know, 70 or 80 percent accuracy. So in addition to those vertical and horizontal marks, one of the other things I like to do is, is let these paths run long. So if I have this angle here, I can extend that and see how it relates to the bend in the knuckle there. And actually, that's kind of a helpful landmark is that I can, I need to keep this basic line, which will then be simple, uh, you know, made more specific. The, the knuckle is going to be somewhere directly in line with that. I can extend this up here. And see how it relates to this intersection here. And you may find you may find any other kind of points of reference uh, that kind of stand out to you. This is a place where um, you can um, find your own way through. There's kind of an implied line there with the kind of the veins leading right to that knuckle. All right, time to kind of wipe this down. Because uh, I don't want the lines to be uh, prominent in this. I want this to be more about value shapes. So as long as I still have a basic sense of the, um, the placement of these forms, I think I need to bring this up here. Um, and I, sh I should be able to find them pretty easily. I don't need anything that's super explicit at this point. Uh, and Gustavo said, mentioned this in his event last night as well, working with portraits. Uh, and he has it in the article, the new May-June issue of Artist Magazine. He's got an, a feature in there. And he talks about the goal of, you know, kind of keeping, keeping edges 
unlocked. I mean, they were not locked down. Um, you know, because we are, are always searching for more refinement. You know, so again, you're, I'm kind of leaving things open for future interpretation and, and further refinement. If I create a concrete line here, then one of the, what it does mentally is it it shifts me into a different mode of thinking, where it's about polish and finish, not search and discovery. All right. Okay, just want to check out the chat here real quick. Um, Eric, watching from Derbyshire over in the UK. Oh, welcome, welcome. A lot of people. Oh, from Argentina, Nadia, welcome. Um, oh, ah, Neurotic Nation. Welcome from the land of enchantment. Um, and then Lollipop Strawberry, do you have to measure your grip hand before drawing. No, I don't. So measurement can be an important aspect of your drawing process. At least you should be aware of the proportions and whether or not you want to have accurate proportions or if you want to play with those. Um, so how you introduce that and where that comes into play is, is part of what defines you as the artist. Um, I'm going to stick with the measurement for a little bit more, but I want to, um, I'm going to switch to this pencil and provide a little bit more concrete um, description of some of these elements. So, for example, we've got the light here on the knuckle. Um, and then we have these basic angles. So just using the kneaded eraser, I'm kind of tapping down just so I can see the top of that hand a little bit better. And I think what I want to do is I at least want to compare the width to the height. Uh, and I think this dimension here is a good one. So from the left side of this knuckle to this bend in the wrist, and I can compare that to the height from the tip of the finger upward. Um, actually, I have a large scale reference here, so I'm going to take that dimension. And actually, what, what's really nice is that this dimension here, that width from knuckle to wrist bend, is equivalent to the, tip, the distance from the tip of the finger up to this knuckle. So that helps me identify at least that the tip of the finger is somewhere around there. Um, and now I want to compare that to this here, create that triangle. And what I see is that, again, if we have this measurement here equals this, and I bring this around, and it should put me right in line with that kind of soft pad above this knuckle. And that's giving me a little bit more confidence in the overall proportions. Um, let's see. I think one of the other things that I'd like to resolve is the edge of this this pot here. And I want to kind of do a quick visualization here to make sure that there's a continuity between the, uh, you know, this side of the pot lid that's being interrupted by the hand. Okay. I'm going to tap up here. One of the things we also talked about in the in the live event yesterday was the idea that 
one of the things that I, I really love about drawing is that it's one of the few art forms um, that can reveal evidence of its own creation, right? We can, we can show these early stages, they become part of the drawing. Of course, they can be highly polished and you can, you can ref refine them, but it also has the potential to show those early stages. So, you know, some of those lines may end up making it through to the end. Um, uh, Edie is saying, I once read a criticism of the hands and feet in Bouguereau's paintings, um, but I think he did them exquisitely. I, yeah, I would say that Bouguereau's certainly, <laughs> he's got to figure it out. Um, I mean, I think everybody has got, they, you know, anybody can have, a criticism, and I think it's always helpful to put ideas out there, um, but they can also be left just as they are, and we don't necessarily have to have to adopt them. Um, you know, I I personally am more inclined to work with landscape than figure, so I don't spend a lot of time contemplating. Um, things like that, but um, I think working from these complex forms like hands are really valuable um, in in that they, uh, for all the reasons I said at the top of the show, where um, we have preconceived notions about how they should look. I mean, if you think about cartoons, for example, it looks awkward for many cartoons to see actually five fingers. So uh, as a result, many are reduced to four. Um, and we accept that, you know, we don't as humans spend a lot of time really analyzing what we look at because that's not what our brains are designed to do. Um, our brains are designed to take in all that information and the subconscious part of our mind takes on the heavy load of processing it all and then deciding what is important enough to be sent to our conscious mind. And often what's most important to us has nothing to do with what it actually looks like. Uh, and but as artists, it starts to become relevant, and that's where um, it can sometimes take time to to kind of override some of the processes in our mind. Uh, and what we're doing is we're trying to um, tell the brain that no, like what I need to know is how I know this looks like the hand, right? What are the little things here that I can extract from it, and how can I? Um, how can I achieve a greater appreciation for the subject by looking deeply at it? Uh, and the more we do that, the better. But I say that to go back to the hands because if as an artist you're looking to capture the experience of being in someone's presence, having an unfinished hand may not be a problem at all. There are many great painters that just left hands unfinished, right? And it works because Again, it relates to our, our own internal understanding of the experience of being with somebody. Um, unless somebody is doing something very dynamic with their hands in a, in a way that we can actually stop and ex examine them, um, we often don't pay attention to really hands very much at all. Um, so I think that gives us leeway in the art world to have a number of interpretations and in what's appropriate and what's not when drawing features. Okay, back to the drawing. I go from gesture to calculation, now to refinement. I want to refine these shapes. And I'm thinking about refining the shapes, not necessarily the values or adding any sort of detail. Um, Edward, welcome from Dublin, welcome. Um, oh, you're using Brent's book. Tell if I, Brent's, a, Brent's a great guy, I love working with him and he has a tremendous Tremendous resources available, especially with figurative work. So, um, okay, now, so what I'm what I'm doing right now is I'm kind of I it, I should point out that my eyes are all out of focus right now. So when I'm looking at the subject, it's it's just kind of a blurred form, and I I want to observe where the form is standing out the most. And so it's somewhere you know right around in here. Um, I can look at this more critically now. And uh, I can add more specificity to that shape. 
And I think I need to sh up my value range here with the pencil. And I might need to actually do some subtractive work here. And I can fill that in. So I'm going to refine there. And I think right in here is where my, um, my eye is drawn. This is a wonderful point to observe these complex curvilinear structures. How we orchestrate and, and organize our, our curves here will go a long way to describing the anatomy. Uh, so we've established the basic forms, but we can start to see that each of these sections here is either a convex or a concave curve that all lock together. So right in this turn here at the wrist, even though it turns to this in this direction, it's made up of shorter segments that move in an opposing direction. So there's still more refinement that I can do, but I'm now adding another layer of specificity. Just gonna, I'm going to keep this as the center of focus, and as I move down in here, I can, um, I can observe them a bit more critically. Just wiping down where I feel like it's too harsh. I don't like that tripod grip. I'm going to switch to this kind of modified overhand. And I just kind of lightly lift up some of that area because this is all very a, a very subtle value relationship here. And it starts to become more defined here. So even on like this stretch here, and I'm not going to describe it as a knuckle, even though it is. I'm in my mind. I'm trying to think. Just what is that shape? What is that line? And you can see kind of a, a complete complex interweaving of again concave and convex form. And we as humans are very good at perceiving those subtleties. Um, before we go any farther, though, I'm going to darken in this area. And I'm going to intentionally use an overhand grip so I can lay the pencil down on its side and roll it as I go, as I fill in these areas. And this helps to keep that tip of the pencil sharp for when I need it. Uh, and what I'm looking for is any kind of directionality to the marks. And if, if I make my marks light, loose, build up multiple layers, you can create a relatively even tone. Okay, just checking to see. Um, uh, oh yeah, that's a good, uh, Stephanie, some good observations about the box of the wrist. So we haven't really talked about perspective, um, but we, you can start to see basic planes like this that kind of recede back into space. Um, it's a challenge to see that the dimension here but I think there are some clues as we get into that form that will help us to um, help us to achieve that. But if there are any other any other observations that anybody has, any different processes, different ways of deconstructing the form, 
uh, it would be good to hear. Okay. Um, I think now I want to move down here again in the in the spirit of just kind of observing where the forms are a bit more um, visible. There's a sharper contrast. Um, I'm going to move down into this area here. Uh, and there's a very light um, distinction between this shape here and the background. So now we see this basic curve here. What, I, what I'm trying to do is lightly see the general shape and then break it down into sequences of shorter, straighter marks to arrive at a more specific form. And it's one of the things that I see often uh, in drawings, figure drawings, that you know, when a, if a student is frustrated with it, often what is the cause is the lack of specificity in forms like this. It's all very subtle, um, but it can be so easy to draw a simple curve here. Uh, and when we do that, we have a tendency to see that as a symmetrical form rather than something that has, you know, more specificity to it. Um, so I think the more you break down those curves and really look closely at where are they sharper, where is it, um, where is it more flat, uh, I think the, the, the better. As I do this, I want to be mindful of the basic relationship between those two shapes. There's a slight downward slope here. And there's really a squaring off of the form across the bottom here. So what I'm doing is applying the same type of thinking that we did to the overall shape of the hand to now smaller forms. Okay, this is definitely going through somewhat of an ugly duckling stage, right? Because now we have enough information to know that it's a hand, but we don't have enough information to make it look like a good hand. <laughs> like there's something wrong with it, right? So you got to stay with it. Don't give up. Um, uh, Peter is asking what's most difficult, figure or landscape drawings. You know, I... That's actually a good question. I would say it's easier to draw a figure than draw a landscape for me, um, but it's easier certainly for me to paint the landscape than to paint a figure. I figure are more complex, but what's challenging in the landscape is so many subtle color variations, and when I don't have um, saturation and hue as, as tools to create a sense of depth, um, it becomes challenging for me, and, and I, I often am underwhelmed by my landscape drawing results. So as I work on adding more clarity to this finger here, now what I'm doing is I'm switching my thinking to the negative space behind that hand. Uh, and then I have to switch a little bit to then thinking about the positive space here. lifting off some of that, that background, looking kind of at that sequence of light to dark. I just want to keep checking to make sure I'm relatively in the right spot. 
And I'm going to lift this off again. There's some nice light that I can lift off here. See if I can observe the basic shape of the light on these forms here. Um, so as we're refining, we're just looking more closely at these forms. And if you're going to keep adjusting, bringing this up. This doesn't look like it's quite, quite right. And part of what, um, at least for me, is required is a certain amount of trust in some of these forms. Because, because I don't have any depth and structure to these forms here, everything looks clumsy. It looks like a, a misformed glove of some sort. And, and so I have to... I have to be trusting that as I, if I keep working on it, I will be able to um, arrive at something that's a bit more, uh, more specific. All right, let's see. So looking at the placement of this fingernail, that fingernail is really a wild form as well. We're going to get into that more specifically later. Okay. Where do I want to go now with this? I feel like this needs to come down a little bit, this finger, this knuckle. If I look at this plumb line here, for example, that helps helps to define that shape a little bit more. All right, I think what I would like to do now is kind of refine the basic light side and shadow side of the hand. So we have this certainly as the light side. And what I'm going to look for is refining this shadow shape. I'm going to use the side of the pencil. It, it again, it it fills in a broader area, and it kind of discourages detail. Um, and encourages um, kind of a broader exploration of the form. And what I'm trying to ex really explore now is the specific um, shape of these. Because when you, when you look at it anatomically and you kind of put your attention on the knuckles, you might arrive at a different understanding than if you look at just shapes of light and shadow. So I'm trying to observe this path here. And then this finger kind of falls in to shadow there. And then when we look down at this area here, we have kind of a sharper play between light and dark. And then this area falls into shadow, but this tip of that form there catches the light. The light catches up in here as well.
And I'm kind of leaving this finger here because I feel like I've got enough information. Um, I think I've got enough information there now to at least feel confident that it's, it's roughly in the right spot. But I think I need to make closer observations and I'm going to I'm going to sit with that a little bit. I'm going to build up other areas for now. Um, okay. Now this, I, I do feel like I need to get this knuckle right. Now one of the things that can be helpful to think about as you're looking at the fingers is to try not to think of them as cylinders, but think of them as cubes. Or, uh, and I think that's kind of what you're getting at, Stephanie, the, as you're observing the box of the wrist. I think the fingers can be the same. They can have kind of a, a top dimension and then a side dimension, right? Uh, and we see that fairly clearly here. It, it gets a little obscured, but it... it um, we can also we can try to find its basic central path here. So now, if I switch my thinking a little bit from thinking about these as abstract forms, we see this knuckle here has kind of a, a pentagonal form. Comes to a point here. We can go down the center of that arm hand or that finger. I'm sorry, until we encounter kind of this boxy part here. It's kind of a light tapping there, so I don't lift that out of the shadow. Um, you know, so it starts to flatten out there, and then we can pick up the the crown on the top of that form there. Um, and now I want to kind of define this path here in the webbing between the knuckles. We have this knuckle here. And we see that tendon that, that comes right in on top. I can rough in the shadow shape of this beautiful vein here that really has some wonderful form to it. I'm going to use the side of the pencil to try to sculpt this a little bit. Um, so one of the things that can be helpful is to really observe these lines as they wrap around the form. So if we look up here, we can see how the lines really kind of slope down into that curve. They come up over, kind of level out, and then wrap around at the end. So you've got, if we were to create this cross contour of the wrist, we got something like this. This so is where it, there's a bit of a crown here. It kind of slopes up to a high point, levels out, and then down and around. Here it's relatively flat. And then we have other, other folds and creases there. How are we doing on time? We're about 45 minutes in. Typically these run about two hours. I do want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions here. Um, uh, Heather's got a great observation. My mind always wants to straighten objects that are angled. And this person's hand looks arthritic and therefore not symmetrical fingers or knuckles. That's a very good observation. Yeah, and that's where I feel like if we focus on light and shadow and we have a solid 
light logic, a structure of the relationship between that. We really we think of this as a form that is being lit. That will go a long way in terms of helping us to understand what we're looking at. That's so that's so true with so many figurative forms. There's um, they're so complex uh, that um, it's and unique, I guess that's what I want to say, is that, you know, everybody's features are very unique and different. Um, and it can be, it can be challenging to really observe those um, and trust those. But if you have light and shadow working in your favor, that can go a long way. All right, so I'm kind of stuck on this edge here. I think this is going to be so critical. And what I see, again, as I see this central kind of peak along here, um, and then with this knuckle form, we see this compounding of the shapes. You just darken this in. Uh, and what I mean by that compounding of the shapes is like this curve comes in on top and along that contour it gets picked up by a curve on the kind of the back side of the hand there where the knuckle starts to project in front. And how we, how we describe those will go a long way also in uh, convincing us that we're looking at a very specific form. Uh, and I think what will also play a role in this is describing the, that fingernail. You know, so if I go like this, that totally changes the angle of the hand, right? So I don't want to do that. Um, this line right here is really important because uh, that, that, fingernail has a slight curve to it. It's mostly flat, but it's got that slight curve. And you've got this curve around there. So you have curves in both directions. Uh, and if you look at it abstractly, what you're really seeing is almost a straight line. You have a little hook there and then starts to level out. Simplify that finger into shorter, straighter marks. And then play with the relationship between light and dark here, lifting that out just a little bit. And I've still got some work to do. This is where subtle, subtle shifts can have a big impact um, it's just it's, it's true with portraiture as well. Uh, here we have part of that handle providing a dark edge against the slightly lighter side there. So it's that sequence of um, kind of light to dark. This is slightly lighter in value than this, and then it shifts where now this is the background is lighter. This is slightly darker. Okay. Um, um, let's see. Storage stover, let's see. Any tips for getting the ellipse of the pot accurate? Um, yeah, let's look at that. Um, I think generally for getting an ellipse, getting the central axis can be helpful. So if we Look at the photo, and we can try to imagine a center line passing right through there. Um, and then from there, if we know where kind of the top of the ellipse is, and we, we essentially want to create kind of a box. Oh, I can lift this up here. 
Um, if we have an angle something like that, we have a top, we have a bottom, we can start to visualize essentially a box in perspective there, right? Um, and as you can find, the, again, the central line, the back side, and the, the front side, uh, that can help you to then round out the curve, find that specific quality. Kind of starting with the idea that at these center points, they're going to be um, either parallel this way or parallel this way, or, you know, or these two would be perpendicular. So that's largely how I see the overall perspective. And then, of course, the hand kind of comes in on top of that. <laughs> that looks very claw-like, doesn't it? So hopefully that helps with the pot. I, I think I drew this a little bit too wide. So then all you'd have to do is bring in these lines here. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that with perspective, this distance should not, not be the same as this. I've kind of drawn it that way. This, since this is farther away, this distance is actually going to be shorter. And so you want to, that central axis is going to be pushed back just a little bit like that. Uh, and I'm kind of of the, the mind that, you know, to, of finding that curve through multiple strikes, right? Not just trying to get it in one curve. I think that can be really handy um, to learn and practice those curves. Um, but I, um, yeah, I, I struggle with trying to draw an ellipse in one go. And I find it often more effective to try and... Uh, really uh, really kind of discover it and, and work that angle. All right, I feel like I what I am going what I need to do is is actually work on the top of the hand now. So with kind of a, a tone built up right that see I just kind of took the some of the charcoal from my hand, built up that tone. I can start to use my kneaded eraser to identify some of the lightest lights. And I can lift out some of kind of the veiny parts, some of the creases that seem to be catching the light. And before you do that, you, you want to make sure you don't get locked in on just thinking about this area. Keep doing check-ins to see where you are relative to the other forms. And in this way, you know, again, we're, we're just observing the shapes of light. Um, and it, we can start to arrive at a certain understanding of anatomy here. I love the way the light catches along this curve here in that vein. And I'm kind of orienting the, a sharp edge. I kind of created a sharp edge on this kneaded eraser. Um, I'm going to orient that in the, the direction that the skin seems to flow in each section. So here it kind of really wraps down and around. This is a great time to really sculpt that form. So it's requiring a little bit more, more thought here. So I'm, I apologize for the lack of speaking. Uh, if you're new, I just want to let you know that what you're watching is Drawing Together. My name's Scott Meyer, and this is Drawing Together with Artist Network. We do this every Wednesday. Find a new subject. Check out all our old episodes. And I'm going to play, pay particular attention to what's happening at this line of termination. The line of termination is the, 
the point at which a form moves from being in light to in shadow. And I think the, the more you can really observe these cross contour marks, the better. Uh, here, if we look at the hand too, the brightest light seem to be just set in from the hand. That helps to create that, or from the, from the edge, I'm sorry. So that helps to create that, a turning edge. All right, blending stump time. I'm gonna apply this the same thinking. So again, look at, really look at how the hand wraps around there. And this compound curve along in here. So as I'm working with the blending stump, I'm letting it roll in my fingers as I go, just like I did with a with the drawing tool. Remember a blending stump or a tortilla like that, I, like I have here, um, it's always an opportunity to help describe form. It's not just for smoothing things out, but it's a great way to describe that form. Do some uh, negative space blending here. Uh, right in here, we can really see how things start to wrap. And then just looking at the shadow, you can see how it's you know, nice and thick there. And then we have this overlapping form where this kind of cuts in on top. And then the shadow splits a little bit there. Uh, so what I'm doing in, in some of these areas here, if I'm observing that there's a general a kind of directionality to the skin that moves this way, but there are also kind of shapes that run this way. So when I'm confronted by that, what I'm looking for are, you know, trying to observe the shape. So this shape here kind of runs down in this direction, but I'm going to kind of create it by creating these uh, shorter kind of vibrations that move along kind of the grain of the finger. And this isn't about getting the values correct here. This is about simply refining the shadow shapes a bit more. Uh, and in particular, trying to identify the planes of these forms as we, as we see them. So there's a fold here, for example. Um, it's in shadow, then there's a light one, another shadow, another fold, another shadow. So try to make each one of your marks really describe something. Um, Saman, I don't think I've, I've had a, a, the right mindset for learning how to draw. I see it as an exchange, basically. My time plus work equals me improving. What are your thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, one way to look at it. Um, I don't see anything um, necessarily incorrect about it. Um, yeah, I think we all have to kind of choose how we spend our time and what I think often gets overlooked in our societies can be the power of taking time to draw. 
Um, and one of the frustrating things is that we often talk about drawing uh, when it, uh, in terms of fine art specifically, when I feel like drawing is more or as much a, a, a broadly human act, um, just like singing or dancing, storytelling. Um, and it can be so much more than simply a means of creating an image, right? It, it can, uh, it, for me, it's about connecting your, connecting to your, what your mind is doing, right? It's, it's a way of discovering more deeply the world around you and understanding your own mind, how you process information. Um, for me, it's a form of kind of meditation because it, it um, brings a certain degree of focus to my mind. Um, um, but there's so many ways that drawing can be used, uh, you know, to solve problems and um, to kind of just engage with your surroundings. Uh, and I think one of the things that we often do as well is that we, when we're communicating with other artists, we sometimes make the assumption that we're all motivated by the same things. We're all motivated to create for the same reason. And I'm not sure if that's true. You know, some of us are storytellers, some of us are explorers, some of us, it's just about expression. Um, and, you know, some often, sometimes it's just to simply make a statement that says, you know, I was here. Um, and you know, and then we, we analyze work. You know, some work is more about its role in society and culture and our times. And, and I think, but the, the real value in it to me is in what we do with it daily. You know, how do we engage with it daily? Cut that down a bit. Reform. Um, so, yeah, as long as you're, you're drawing, I just think, I feel like it's one of those, one of those parts of humanity that we, I wish more people did, not so that we have more artists, but that, so we have, everybody can see the power and in, in the potential beyond just simply making an image. All right. So again, I'm just thinking about it really in terms of light and shadow at this point. I love working with the blending stump in this regard. So one of the nice things when working with that block of graphite is that it's relatively soft, and so it allows me to pick up um, more material. So Saman, I don't know if that helped answer your question or if I just went on to a wild tangent that had nothing to do with what you're asking. So if not, then let me know. <laughs> Always love to hear everybody else's take on it. I try not to just blow smoke, but um, it gives us something to think about. Okay. Um, so how am I feeling about this? Let's see. Yeah, I definitely think it's worth the time and work. Yeah, I mean, I think if we if we immerse ourselves in the, the mindset that it has to be good, we limit ourselves to some degree. Um, so many great discoveries in our world have come as a result of people doing things the wrong way, using an instrument the wrong way, and then discovering an entirely new sound that then, then takes over the world, right? Um, 
And there are certainly times when we want to kind of engage with that side. You know, when we do something quote unquote right, that can be helpful in some cases by letting us know you know that if we're you know we're practicing that we're we're hitting our target, um, but I think there's also room in an artistic practice to to abandon that goal of correctness and instead embracing the challenge of doing things wrong. How can I break this process? How can I think about it differently? Um, and I, I, I hope that one of the things that com- came out of this pandemic, the idea that a lot of people have been at home alone, is that it's given people safety to, to create without fear of having to show it to anybody. Um, and, you know, I kind of accept that the work that I do as part of the show is not designed to be hung in a gallery or have any greater ambition other than to give me the opportunity to be here Again, take time out of our busy lives to study this form and it and give me a deeper appreciation for something like a hand. Um, and if I apply any more pressure than that, I I can end up really kind of hurting myself. Okay, so just looking for those subtle folds as we move across from light and shadow. Does anybody have kind of any questions about where what I'm kind of doing at this point, how I'm thinking? Um, I would love to hear it if you're if you have an entirely different approach. Um, the as I'm as I'm looking now, I want to give particular attention to that transition from light into shadow. What is happening at that edge? What are the di- what direction do I need to make the marks? How big are they? Um, is it a hard transition? Is it a soft one? Those are some of the things that I'm working on observing. Now, it's really easy to get lost here as well. So make sure before you kind of strike any mark here that you're taking some time just to check in to make sure you're in the right spot. Uh, and again, I'm looking at where the oh what I put my phone on airplane mode. Why would I do that? Sorry about that. No. There, yeah, you can see my setup there as I shift my camera. Uh, are we back? There we go. Okay. Um, I look more into, into how I process information from reality, how we represent it on the page. Um, yeah, it, what you're saying, uh, Saman, about focusing on the technical aspects, there's certainly, I, I think, an important aspect to that, right? Um, it's just like learning an instrument. Uh, You may have a desire to create a song, for example, but if you have no idea how to play the instrument, that can be very inhibiting. At the same time, learning purely the fundamentals without getting the satisfaction of creating a song can also make things difficult. And so what I try to do is I try to, I try to, um, I try to force those two together. There's a learning objective always, and I want to be satisfied in the image I'm creating. So try to identify what can I what can I glean from the subject that will help me advance. Uh, how do I need to grow, and what what subject should I choose in order to achieve that? Um, and and so you pick up skills and techniques through these exercises of drawing. Um, but I, I do feel like there is a lot of value in 
trying to clear the expectations from your mind about what it should look like and instead really connect with what it does it look like, right? And and keep adjusting from there. Um, and you can learn a lot about technique and skill by making incorrect marks, using things, quote unquote, the wrong way. Um, so there's always value in something that doesn't go the way you want it to. Uh, and I think if the, the more you can identify that, the the more opportunities you give yourself for growth. Everything becomes an opportunity for growth at that point. Um, so um, a lot of, like I said, a lot of it is, is mindset and expectations. I know for myself, I struggled with that for a very long time. I've talked about that before in the show is that, you know, I had always created as part of my identity that I was quote unquote an artist um, and that I could draw accurately relatively, right? And, and so then I would be in classes and I would be work creating work that just really wasn't wasn't doing it for me. Um, and and it it impacted my sense of self because if I say, well, you know, I my identity is formed by my ability to draw and I'm really struggling with that now. What does that say about me? Uh, and that was really destructive and it's taken 25 years to help put that into context. Okay, so um, going to, to edges, look, if we look here at this cast shadow, this knuckle here is casting a shadow on this finger. Look how diffused that is. And then we see sharpness under here where the edge of the finger is. Um, and we're gonna see some variation along in here as well. So we'll pull that out as well. Um, and then Jane says, once you're, free, once you're comfortable with the technical part, it frees you up to go with further ideas. I totally, I totally agree. The more comfortable you are with it, the, the better. Um, but I do feel like also part of what helps us learn is that dopaminergic response, right? When, when something feels good, we've, we've decided that we want to go for it. We want to get become a better drawer. We go for it. We take a risk. And we feel a reward from that. It releases dopamine. And that is what helps to really encode that knowledge. So it feeling good becomes an essential part of learning. And that's one thing that I didn't really factor in much when I was younger, but I start to appreciate more. Um, and sometimes it's not always that everything goes right. You just learn how to recontextualize things. So try to recontextualize failures. If you can feel good about failing, then you're always learning. So, um, all right. Peter and Liz, sounds like um, might be heading out. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's see. Queen of peace and love, how are you deciding what transition you should use? So. Um, hopefully, let me let me try to think about that more specifically. Um, but it, it ultimately comes down to deciding two things. There's direction and shape. So I'm trying to observe the shape, which is easier to see if you squint your eyes. And then what I'm trying to look at is what clues in the subject um, give me a sense of what direction I need to move my material. So if we look in here, for example, we see these creases in kind of the webbing between the knuckles. They're moving in a specific direction. And so I can use that to inform the direction of my marks. Um, and again, I'm looking at areas where it might be kind of a harder transition and where it might be softer. All right, now let me switch to this 12B. This thing's going to be wicked dark. Uh, and I want to create a little bit more variation, both left and right sides. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at this edge here, and what I see is a really thin sliver of the shadow core that's not right up to the edge. It's just inset. And there is a plane to that hand that runs kind of up. So I really want to tr create these marks that wrap around the form. I'm 
just going to use the side of the pencil for a lot of these. And in here, the tooth of the paper can actually come in handy in suggesting some of that skin texture. Uh, as we move over here, I'm looking really closely at that edge and trying to incorporate some variation in that edge. Uh, so what I'm doing with this overhand grip is I'm trying to align the core of the pencil with the direction of some of these creases that I'm seeing. And then pulling my hand along the structure of the hand. So if I see it curving this way, I want to move my hand this way. But the, the, the axis of this pencil is going to align really with those, those creases. I'm just looking for a little bit areas that are a little bit darker. And I'm really excited later on to add some of those highlights to really pull this pull out some of the form here. Here in this shadow, it's a little bit softer along this outer edge here. And it's a darker, it's a darker mark right in kind of in the center of that. And then we get a sharp cut there. So here with those bumpy veins, you can change the direction of your marks to, to indicate the, the incline of that plane. Um, so let me see, I'm going to move down along in here. Uh, and I'm seeing some variation between the reference photo and my drawing, so I have to decide, am I, am I cool with that? You know, or does it need to be more specific? And I think in general I'm cool, as long as it, as long as it describes the overall structure of the hand. You know, if I have a, a vein or a tendon that's slightly out of place, I'm not going to be too concerned unless it um, unless it's wildly inaccurate. Okay. Um, now as we encroach on this knuckle here, Um, again, I'm going to be looking closely at where the form gets darkest. So I'm going to try to map out some of the, the shadow core in the hand here. So what I mean by that um, is, you know, we have light coming dominantly from this direction, but we also have it bouncing around from other areas in the environment. And that's striking the edges of some of these areas in shadow. It leaves areas like right in here between the fingers as being darker. Um, but then we also have areas in here where, you know, as the form wraps around this way, it might be catching a little bit more light on this side. It starts to make a turn and it changes value. And one of the keys to really creating form and structure is to observe the change in light quality wherever there is a change in direction of the plane, right? Especially a, a major change. So for example, this form here really has a curve to it. And then we have like the webbing that transitions into the next knuckle. And you can get a feel for the way these forms flow together. And where the plane changes are more distinct, you're going to see a shift in value. It's either going to reflect more light or it's going to catch more shadow. Uh, and if you're 
careful. You just want to make sure that those variations, if they're happening within a shadow form that um, or a shadow shape, that you're, you're not creating so much contrast that it really kind of pops off of the page. All right, so here we see that, that fold here. Um, all right, just kind of focusing a little bit more here. Uh, Susan, yes, that's a good observation about those contour lines when drawing trees. Those are great subjects to, to work with. Um, I think what I need to do is I need to define this edge a little bit more. And um, this is negative space back in here. So I'm going to be kind of building up that darker background. And it's a relatively sharp edge, even though it's, it's a, a low value contrast, it's a sharper edge. And what I'm hoping for is that the contrast and value with this side being a little bit darker now will make this feel like a convincing bounce light. What I need to do is actually change the direction of my mark a little bit so that it's not running parallel to the form. But if it intersects even a little bit, it can be helpful. So as I find that edge and then I'm kind of feathering it out into that, that dark space inside that pot that she's holding. It's a cool little notch in her finger here, a lot of these little details. Um, now one of the things that can often describe kind of the age of the subject will, is the quality of the reflections, you know, if, um, if you have more wrinkles in there, it's breaking up the light more, you might get a smoother kind of transition or smoother ref reflection there. So um, I'm going to be looking at those. Uh, time to bring out my trusty Dirgwent eraser here to sharpen up that edge. And then right in along here. So I kind of overstated that. And whenever I need to create a sharper point to my pencil, I'll just flip it on its side and use that overhand grip. Use this to draw a little bit, fill in some of those shadows. Uh, I'm gonna get, make sure I get a, a decent curve to this this pot here. That I want to make sure that it feels right. I'm gonna drop that down a little bit, and this is a little bit stronger. And then I want a sharp edge along in here. So I'm going to be careful along that edge so I don't create too much of a, a distinct line here. And then kind of feather that out. All right, so I, I feel like that really helps to clarify things a little bit for that hand. Although I, I did, this shape is not working for me. So very light pressure. And I'm just going to keep working that edge.
Um, uh, Jane is asking if, if you draw something that is not the hand yet, you can absolutely post it. I would love to see your work. So you'll find a link to the show page. Again, if you're new, you're, you'll find a link to that show page in the description below. Um, and it's in the chat. Try to find this edge a little bit here. Um, I might keep it a little bit softer in some areas just to help reinforce that form. Um, and there, you, right here, I used that line to define that edge. I'm going to try getting rid of it, see what I think of it. Kind of let that background consume it. But you may find that you want a line. So, for example, right in here, maybe drop in a, a longer line here. I didn't really get the shape of this pot correct. All right, and I want to just kind of check along in here, see if I can create more variation. I like there's a little bit of bounce light coming right in here. And then we're really going to get some nice details once we start to um, as we start to add some of the white highlight in here. Okay, back to this section. I just kind of needed a break from this part here. I'm going to switch to the overhand grip. And try to build in these areas. And try not to be too harsh with the at the transitions here, um, and you know keep changing the direction of my marks to see if that'll help with the the plane changes. Okay, I'm going to switch back to this. How's everybody doing with their drawing? I know this is a challenging subject, but I hope it has been informative, and hopefully you, you take a chance on it. Remember, you don't have to show it to anybody. I think we all need time, so we just need to do work for ourselves. So now right in here, beautiful fold. And really take some time to observe that complex structure. So I'm just working my way across those knuckles there. So really the rest of the drawing is just focusing on these areas. And if we've set up the structure of the hand properly um, with regards to light and shadow, it goes a long way to uh, suggesting detail. Uh, neurotic Nation question, is the lower part of the index finger going away from us? Yes, I think it it feels that it, like it is slightly, but it's hard to really tell. Um, I don't know if there's quite enough information to make a specific decision, but I see it as that way, and I, I but I could totally be wrong. 
All right, and just sharpen this up with the eraser here. Um, and then I'm going to use the in the kneaded eraser, or not, I'm sorry, the rubber eraser. If you just kind of tap with it, it can often lift a fair amount of material, um, and it can be enough just to at least sharpen an edge. So I'm just looking for the shapes of kind of the darker areas in the shadow form. Trying to change direction with the marks. Okay. Um, uh, Paul is saying, is there any desire to allow for more interaction like Zoom for real-time feedback as we're drawing? Um, that is exactly some of the things that we are discussing right now uh, our, at Artist Network. Um, we are in the process of ad adjusting our content strategy and um, one of the things we're discussing is uh, you know, the role that these live events will be playing. You know, we want to be able to deliver more instruction, more useful instruction, and, um, and also make the most out of live events. And one of those ways is to actually have feedback. So there's, that's definitely on the, on the table and part of what we're discussing. A lot of it comes down to kind of resources and what type of platform will work best, how we want to design those events, etc. All right, so back under here, I'm going to refine this shape using the eraser first. Uh, and then as out of this kind of sh shadow core, you know, we have, we see this diffused line. Um, but we see um, these shadow forms kind of emerging from it. So I'm just going to play with these shapes here. There's this one's kind of almost a subtle S-curve. Um, but you just want to make sure that they're not reading like stripes. And, and one way that I like to think about that is, again, as I observe that path, I create that mark by c using directional marks that run contrary to the overall shape, if that makes sense. So if the shape is moving this direction, I'm pulling this direction by, while creating marks that move perpendicular to that or at a different angle to that. Here I'm looking at the direction of the marks. It's mostly the, it's kind of a grain to the flesh there. And in this way, so the hatch marks can actually go a long way in describing the texture and describing the age of the hand. Here, there's that, that shadow core on the knuckle that I want to smooth out. I really want to observe how these marks wrap around that knuckle. Um, and so it's a, again, it can be subtle, but it can make a big difference overall. Here there's this crease that kind of wraps in underneath the that fold there. And 
Now, I can't really see the edge of the finger as it emerges from the shadow, you know, in this section here. So I'm not going to invent it. Um, I'm just scraping along the side here. And as we, as we come down to this area of darkness, and what I'm mostly observing is how sharp or diffused that edge of the shadow is. Okay, so there it gets really dark in here where we see a little gap in that finger, a little shadow on that side. And that curve almost changes direction. You can really see that, you know, there's there are angles to this curve, uh, and I can refine that with the eraser. How are we doing on time? Well, an hour and forty minutes, not too bad. Um, but we're gonna, so we should end up right at about two hours. Uh, so right on here in this knuckle, again, it goes kind of into the shadow here, it comes out, and then what it seems to me is that there is a slight darkening of the shadow right in here. So you get a little bit of bounce light in there. And if you notice on the, the areas where we're observing bounce light, I'm not really lifting with the eraser because uh, that is one of the, the things that I see um, sometimes with uh, with students who are just kind of practicing is an overstatement of the um, the reflected light so like right in here I think I do want to lift out a little bit more of the reflected light but I don't want to get down to that white paper I'm just kind of pressing in along there just to enough to lift a little bit, but hopefully it doesn't stand out substantively. Okay. All right, so now as we as we work on this index finger, I'm mostly looking at the direction of these creases that fall into that shadow. And so we talked about there being two planes to that hand. Um, we see kind of marks here that indicate the, kind of the surface of that finger. And then it changes direction and it really starts to wrap down away from us. Now I'm kind of going a bit bigger than I need to and I'll have to refine that farther with the eraser here. But And be careful with these creases in the knuckles. You see that they run in all different directions. They're not like tiger stripes that run kind of, I mean, tiger stripes don't literally run in the same direction, but you know, we, we have a tendency to treat them as kind of repetitive forms. And we want to look for the irregularity. That's kind of what we would expect to see. And if that's something we expect to see, we don't notice it, <laughs> which is kind of weird. The more we expect, the less we are aware of because that's our, our subconscious mind is designed to see what doesn't fit, what's out of the norm, and that's what tends to be sent to our conscious minds. All right, so I want to kind of sharpen up this side a little bit. Just wanna, let me see, I'm going to soften that, and I'm just going to keep using both an additive and subtractive process uh, to try to describe this, this finger here. I'm going to use the blending stump, actually. Uh, 
and then I'm going to have to reestablish the, uh, the light on this side of the finger. It's a little bit darker right up in here. Okay, so I'm going to start with the kneaded eraser. Let's see how far we can get with this, this thing. I'm just tapping with it to try to describe the light. And again, trying to observe where is it a sharper light and where is it more diffuse. It's kind of sharpest right here along that knuckle. And then it gets a little bit more diffused in here. Um, and then right in here, there's it's really catching the light along that edge. And it turns right into that light part on the, the finger there. Going to keep working that thumbnail, or the fingernail. And I think what I need to do is lift that highlight a little more there. So I'm just keep working back and forth, additively and subtractively. Uh, I'm going to use the 2B here so that I'm not too dark with these marks. I just want to sharpen up. So I'm using, using the harder but lighter material. Actually, there's some right in here I want to darken a little bit. I need to create some variety along that edge where the bounce light is. And it's a little bit, we're getting a little bit more light in here. Let's see how that does. Uh, so I can use this eraser and just kind of lightly scrape, trying to, trying to discover the cross contour information here. So in that way, the eraser blends a little bit, but it also adds an interesting texture here. Again, trying to really find that contour. Uh, and then I need to bring this up a little bit more, a little bit darker right in here. Um, and we can kind of just press with the sharp edge of the eraser to suggest more detail in the shadow side. And here with this finger here, it gets a little bit darker towards this edge. And then the highlight gets a little bit lighter right in there. And I think the same with this one. So I'm going to use the eraser to sharpen that edge some more. And then lift right in along here. All right. So I think we're in pretty decent shape for now then using the, the blending, uh, the, uh, the white charcoal. Um, and before I do that, though, I just want to look for areas where I might be applying that white charcoal and lift more of the graphite off the page. Because I haven't been super careful with keeping those areas clean, so... Um, with the, with this eraser, again, I can kind of lightly scrape over the contour of the hand to you know, kind of help unify some of these forms if it's feeling too, uh, I don't know, too unblended, too chunky. All right, so now with the, with the white, I'm going to bring in a little bit on the highlight along this edge. And 
And I need to look up ahead because from the, the way the light is glistening off the paper here, I'm not able to see the white um, very well. So I'm going to look up in the, uh, on the screen here to see really what I'm ultimately capturing. So I'm just being really careful not to bring the brightest brights right up to that edge. I want there to be some barrier, you know, some subtle transition there. Um, here there's a kind of a broader plane. So I'm using the side of the pencil again to, because that helps me to utilize the tooth of the paper. Um, and it also keeps the pencil sharp for when I really need those fine edges. bring more light into kind of this front, the front of the knuckle, help to bring the whole, um, the, the whole hand forward a bit more. So I'm trying to bring out the highlights from this section. Um, but let me see what happens if I had a few, few lights back in here. Oh, there's a really nice Uh, and really try to be thinking about the planes that might be kind of angled more towards the light source. And that is likely where it'll be lighter in value. Uh, actually, I want to use the eraser in some areas more. You can use your, your pencil very lightly to sharpen up an edge and it's blending with some of that graphite in a place like that. Like I said, it can sharpen up that edge without advancing it too much. And there are some places along this edge where you get a crease that kind of catches the light more. So like right in here, this side of this, this pad that's been formed catches the light a little bit more right in here. So let's see what that does. That brings out some nice form. I'm gonna bring out some of the light along there. And add some more to this knuckle along here. And now I would need to bring that down in here into this finger where the light's striking a little bit more. And again, just using the side of the pencil. And right in here, it's really catching that nicely. But um, just catching that a little bit on that edge. Um, and I think I want to lift out some of the highlight here and along in here. So right, right up against that finger, it's a nice bright light. And then I can use this to sharpen up some of this edge along in here. I should be mindful of the direction of that pot, the perspective of that, that edge. So I can change the direction so that it aligns with the slope of that edge of the that pot that she's holding. All right, and see how that works. I think it works out all right. 
Uh, right in here, I can pull out a bit of a highlight towards the, the high point on the fingers. And right in here, we can give a little bit more structure to some of these little folds that are in here. I don't know, so right now, I'm just kind of picking around the, the drawing, just adding a little bit more refinement as I see. Um, So I hope everybody's enjoyed this. I'll keep working on it a little bit more. Um, I have not yet decided what we're drawing next week. So if anybody's got any suggestions, I'm all ears. Um, I'll use the 2B to add a little bit more kind of sharpness in some areas. I think maybe what I'll do is I will kind of refine some in this area, let this kind of fall off a bit more. Yeah, so maybe I want to kind of sharpen some of these lines a bit more. Um, but I hope this is a valuable project for you all to be introduced to. I look forward to seeing your drawings. Uh, again, share them on artistnetwork.com. If you know anybody who could benefit from these videos, point them in our direction, and it's always better to try to grow, try to grow the group. So. Whew, this has been a, a tough one. I feel my brain is now a bit foggier <laughs> as we've been thinking about it. Um, okay. All right, thank you for the comments, everybody. Um, yeah, Barb E, that's a really good observation that drawing the creases is a lot like drawing draped fabric. Um, and I think that's, that's a, again, a really good observation, and I think one of the reasons why it's really valuable from my perspective, to think of drawing as a set of decisions, not not thinking of drawing as you know uh, that we learn a process for drawing a specific thing and that's that's it. You know, we you can you can apply learnings from drawing fabric to drawing hands and faces and full figures. Um, you, know, you can draw you know, as you learn from landscapes can help you. With your port, uh, with your still lives, or something, or with your with your portraits, or vice versa. I'm just kind of darkening in a little bit more in some of these areas. Yeah, I like the the character in these hands is really really nice when I check out the the I've, um, you know check out this photographer I believe this was on Unsplash. But whew, I think I'm gonna call it a day. This has been a long one. <laughs> All right, so let's see what. Um, Hello, Leslie's saying, I vote we draw a tiger. We should, I should look at that. I think we did one a while ago. An all line drawing, like a Mobius, that'd be interesting. Um, uh, Steven is saying, has anyone ever fixed their pencils and then maneuver their paper to draw? It sounds very backwards, just came to mind. Uh, yeah, that could be an interesting experiment to give that a try. Uh, good way to shake up the brain there. Uh, how about a tu tubal structure? Like a traditional lighthouse. Oh, that could be good. Yeah, it's been a while since we drew, drew a lighthouse. Um, 
uh, I think, or uh, one of the uh, one of the projects in the book is a is a silo in the neighborhood here, uh, or where I where my home is. Um, all right. Well, I appreciate everybody for joining me. It looks like we got through all the questions. I might pick around at this for a little bit more, but I think largely it's done. Um, I tend to call it a day when I figure I, when I feel like I'm just picking away and I'm not really describing a whole lot more. And I, I'm kind of at that point here. So um, I want to thank you all for joining me. Oh, I can switch to the full screen. Yeah, again, I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, check out next week. I will be hopefully posting that soon. Um, everybody have a fantastic holiday weekend if you're here in the U.S. So um, uh, Jane and Jackie, those are some great observations. Saman, I like that as well. Um, so many things that we could think about. So again, I appreciate you all. Have a fantastic week. I will see you next Wednesday.